prelude to a kiss. First play, yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess you do it on a dare. You audition, uh, you get a small part. What about that experience kind of hooked you? You know, I'd never done theater. My girlfriend and I had broken up and I was, I was sad. And uh, it certainly changed the trajectory of my life because of my best friend, Paul, who saw me as like glum and dour and sad and melancholy and, you know, just like bummed out. And he's like, you need to do something different. So why don't you do a play? And I said, well, I would audition if he would. And here we are, two fraternity guys. And we go up to the theater department to uh, audition for a play, Prelude to a Kiss in Hamlet. I learned a, a Claudius speech for my audition for Hamlet, to sweet and commendable in your nature, Hamlet, to give these morning duties to your father. Still remember a little bit of it. And so I did that, and then I uh, auditioned for Prelude. He got cast as Bernardo in Hamlet, and I got cast as Uncle Fred in Prelude to a Kiss. You later thanked uh, the, the ex because of how it <coughs> positively impacted Yeah, I 100% it. just, told her, I mean, like, she, she had the courage to break up with me. Like, you know, I was still in the mode, when, when she broke up with me, I was still in the mode of just do what most people do, and that's go to college, get a job, get married, and have kids. And so I wasn't going down this crazy road, and it was her breaking up with me that led me to theater, which then led me to audition for Ringling Brothers twice, which got me back into this idea of entertaining people, which as a kid I showed a penchant for doing. I just never synthesized and said, I want to be an actor. It was just, I want to make people laugh. And so she was responsible for me getting back onto that, that path. How well do you remember the letter you wrote to your parents when you got to Chicago? I remember it. I, I've looked at it a couple times. I didn't know what my job was gonna be, but they supported me so much in emotionally and financially at that point that I knew I needed to let them know that I was gonna work. And, you know, in the beginning, it was like stapling resumes to headshots. Right. Like, every day, you know, work. What about even thinking about that now touches you a bit? Well, that I just didn't, I didn't know what, it was, and I don't know where I got that um, ability to have such confidence in being willing to fail. And so uh, there was probably a little bit of me thinking like, well, I gotta go for it, you know, because dad's set the platform, mom and dad have set the platform for me to, to go forward and, and fail. I mean, you got, or succeed, I mean, I didn't know, so. To what extent is that a weight to carry? at the time? It was scary, because I didn't know anyone in Chicago. I knew I wanted to take a class, classes at a place called Improv Olympic. I knew I wanted to study at Second City. But I think mom and dad, you know, you talk to mom, I think she would tell you that they were pretty, pretty impressed that I was willing to do it. You know, we drove up in my car in a, in a U-Haul, my dad drove the U-Haul, and mom and I were in the car, we traded back and forth. And then they stayed for a couple days, my dad and I carrying up a couch up the back stairs at 6.30 West Addison. And then I drove them to O'Hare and walked to their gate with them. And, um, you know, said goodbye. And like, they, that they were proud of me. And it was, it was, it's crazy to think now, looking back, that I had the ability to do that like not patting myself on the back, something innately in me that was given to me by them and by a greater power. Because um, I had no idea what I was doing. And I chose Chicago because I knew the city, I loved the city. And I thought, well, let me go there and see if anyone says I'm good. Feel that out. And if I get some success there, then, you know, I'll know. Looking back on that now, what uh, about it specifically is so powerful to you? Because it turned out okay, you know? Like, I, I, I achieved more than I ever thought I would achieve or really could achieve. I didn't, I didn't know, and I just knew I needed to find out. And so I got there and quickly asserted that, like, for my little K-State theater training and classes that I had, like, I'm in a professional acting class with people that are there to be actors. I'm holding my own. And you know, my acting school was really getting out into the city of Chicago every day and like just being around people and watching people and looking at people, observing people. And then hopefully that all that just 
soaking all that up. Like I feel it's like so important to as a performer, as an actor, to have so many diverse experiences with people. Um, and that, you know, looking back on it, that I was so nervous and scared, and really was for about 14 years, <laughs> like <laughs> truthfully, like, and then, you know, success. The nerves and fear go away once you had success? No, they, okay. they intensify. I mean, it, it, they change. Um, because, you know, you've heard every actor you've ever talked to talk about the fact that someone's going to, you know, figure out that you're, you're a fraud. Like, that never goes away. I still have the dreams of, you know, not knowing my lines or jumping in on something and being thrown out on the stage. Those, those, that anxiety and those fears are in you. I mean, there's so many things about business that are, I, I don't love the word triggering, but are triggering. Um, like what? Well, wardrobe. You know, for years as a commercial actor, which is what I was in Los Angeles, you know, trying to... Paid the bills. Paid the bills. Me being a bigger guy, I, I would have these conversations with wardrobe people that'd be like, now what size are you? Like over the phone. I'm like, well, I'm a 38 or 40 jean. And, you know, and then, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I showed up to sets and they'd be, be like, oh, well, you're not as big as I thought you were going to be. You know, just... Things like that. So then when you're on a set and they bring you clothes that are too small for you or what, those kinds of things are, are triggering how you're completely at the bottom of the barrel uh, on so, in so many situations as an actor trying to make it. And then when you finally have some success and feel like, well, I'm kind of a, kind of a big deal now, and then you're, boom, slapped right back down to reality of like, well, can you bring your own suit because we can't find a 50 long? Like, okay, yeah. When you finally uh, made it in you know, your mind, uh, you feel like you deserved it? That's funny. Like, like I remember like when I got Modern Family or when I got, had other success before Modern Family and I would get an email or a phone call or a text, if texting was available then, and someone would say, Man, you deserve this. I know that the intention probably is is pure, mm -hmm. but it always bothered me when somebody would say, "You deserve this." It's like, well, maybe I, I don't. I don't know. It's funny you use that word. Um, it it always bothered me. And then I always identified friends that if you got a call back or um, a job, and their reaction to you was anything other than excitement for you. If you tell someone, hey, I got a call back for that Sonic commercial I went on, and they're like, God dang it, you have to find a path to get them out of your life because you've identified someone who doesn't have your best interest in mind, is in competition with you, and this job is not about if I'm successful, you can't be successful. Like, we each can have success in our own way, so people that are anything less than happy for you or can't pretend to be happy for you, right? you got to move them to the side.